My name is Cliff Goodwin, and I'm truly grateful that you have taken this time out of your day to join me here for Preaching the Gospel. The privilege is mine to take the next half hour or so with you, our viewing audience, so that we might go through the Word of God together, gleaning more and more of the riches of His Word. I have my Bible open before me, and as I typically do, I want to invite you also to take your Bible down at home or at work, wherever you might be tuning in or logging on, and let's go through the Word of God together and make the most of this time. Today, I'd like for us to study concerning a lesson that could be simply entitled, The Vain Glory of Life. The Vain Glory of of life. Now, some of you might recognize that expression. It is, in fact, a biblical expression, uh, depending, I guess, especially or particularly on which version or translation from which you're reading. But when we speak of the vain glory of life, we're talking about an attitude, we're talking about a disposition of heart in which man, the creature, He becomes so self-sufficient, as it were. He essentially becomes puffed up, in a sense, against his creator, against God himself. And so we're going to look at this, of course, biblically, uh, considering matters that the Bible tells us with regard to this topic, in hopes that you and I, as individuals, that we can ward off that disposition or that attitude from ever creeping into our hearts. The vain glory of life and the attitude pertaining thereunto, it is not a good thing. That's not something of which we want to be guilty before God. And so having said these things, let us go now to the text. Open your Bible with me to 1 John chapter 2. And in 1 John chapter 2, we'll read three verses, and in the reading of these three verses, uh, we'll be able to introduce this very subject. Beginning in verse 15, the Bible here tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Perhaps many of you in our viewing audience, you have heard various sermons through the years about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You've likewise probably heard numerous sermons regarding the world in this conception, if you will. The the world being that realm, that moral order or spiritual realm that is opposed to God and Christ. It is opposed to righteousness and truth and godliness. Uh, It could even be described, if you would, as being the unsaved standing in contrast to the saved. People are, are either in the world, morally and spiritually speaking, or they are in the kingdom of Christ. They are in His church, one or the other. And of course, I'm talking about accountable persons. And so many of you have heard these sermons or these lessons on the world and on these avenues of sin, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, what is significant is the connection between these two ideas, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When an individual lives his life and directs his life, In accordance with those three principles, he is obviously a person of the world, a person in the world. Now, tragically, in some instances, this individual might well have obeyed the gospel at some previous point, 
But the, the problem is he has now lapsed. He has now gone back into the ways of the world. And so for all intents and purposes, he's living like the world, and he would be classed with the world in a real sense. What I want us to do today is I want us to realize that the pride of life, as it appears in the King James Version, it is translated in other versions as the vain glory of life. The vain glory of life. Now, that wording, at least to me personally, is very descriptive. When we think of glory, we, we think of honor. Uh, you can even use the word glory also in the sense of a boast. You know, Paul would, would talk about that in which we are to glory or not to glory, so to speak. And so when you think of the idea of something that is an honor, something that is a grounds for boasting in a sense, well, then this concept really begins to take shape. It really begins to come alive. We see that it is a glory connected to life, to this life, life upon this earth. But then further, we see that it is described as vain or empty. And how often is that the case? Uh, so much, in fact, one could argue that practically everything that finds a basis in this life, a basis that is separated from the Word of God, different or in contrast to the Word of God, well then truly it is vain, it is empty or futile, useless. And so this vain glory of life is describing an attitude of heart in which someone is full of themselves, they glory in their own blessings, they glory in their own abilities or their own riches and resources, whatever it may be, but their glorying is vain. It's vain because it is cut off from God. It is set in contrast to God's will. Now, perhaps you're following along with me, and, and maybe not. Maybe you're still sitting there at home or at work or or wherever you may be, and, and you're still trying to wrap your mind around this concept. And so to help us see even more or to understand better, number one, what I want us to do in this study is I want us to first talk about lowliness. Lowliness. The idea of lowliness, also sometimes translated or described as humility, the, the word behind that term, lowliness, it means quite literally not rising far above the ground. Not rising far above the ground. Now think how, of, how fitting and how appropriate that is because all the way back in the Genesis account, Genesis 2 and verse 7, we learn that man was created from the dust of of the earth. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so our very origin as humankind is the dust of the earth. Now, now don't lose sight of that. How fitting then that lowliness, as it is enjoined in the scriptures, lowliness comes from a word which means not rising far above the ground. It's really rather simple. We as human beings, we are to be mindful of our origin. We are to be mindful of our frame, if you will, the manner in which God created us. And that mindfulness, that remembrance of our very nature, it ought to cause us to remain humble to be lowly in heart. Now, let's look together to some passages dealing with lowliness. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, I therefore, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you 
that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. In other words, if we were to paraphrase that greatly, we would say, I want you to live faithfully the Christian life. I want you to be diligent and faithful in Christian living. Now, what does that entail? Verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so right out of the gate, so to speak, as Paul says, look, I am beseeching you. I want you to walk worthy of your Christian calling. I want you to live a faithful Christian life. Right out of the gate, he begins dealing with matters which pertain to unity, emotional unity between brethren. If we as fellow Christians, if we are going to remain unified and knit together as God wills, that's going to take heaping amounts of lowliness on the part of each one, meekness, a a willingness to suffer wrong himself instead of inflicting wrong on others, forbearance, uh, putting up with one another, putting up with one another's weaknesses and frailties in love. And I even skipped over there, long-suffering, literally being long-tempered, not quick to wrath, not quick to anger, but but patient, long-suffering. So all of that is essential to unity. But it's interesting to me that lowliness leads the list. Now, turn over a book with me to the book of Philippians. And notice likewise what the Apostle Paul wrote here in Philippians chapter 2 concerning this quality. Beginning at verse 3, he said, Let nothing be done through strife, or vainglory, notice our term, vainglory. Okay? This self-sufficient attitude in which we are glorying, we are boasting in the richness and in the blessedness of our lives, let nothing be done through that kind of motivation, but instead in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things or on his own interests, but every man also on the things, the interests of others. I mean, that is Christian living 101. That's the Christian mentality that we're all to possess. And notice that it's grounded in lowliness. It's grounded in selflessness. It's grounded in looking out for one another, putting others' needs even ahead of our own. That is basic Christian living. And yet lowliness is at the very heart of this. Now let's go on one book further. Let's go to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. And here, the same Greek word for lowliness is translated a little differently, but but it's the same Greek word or Greek word family, and the point, that the point is essentially the same. Look at Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on bowels of mercies, compassion, pity, kindness, and then notice here, humbleness of mind, lowliness, humbleness of mind, Meekness, long suffering. See, these are all beautiful sisters, if you will. Uh, you think of lowliness, you think of meekness, you think of long suffering. It's as if they are all beautiful sisters in the same family. Verse 13 Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, I've spent this time and and I've gone over this idea of lowliness because I want us to understand it is the very opposite in many ways. It is the very opposite of the vainglory of life or 
as the King James Version put it, the pride of life. See, I, I think we need to understand that not only are we to be humble and lowly because of our nature, because of our our frame with which God made us, but we need to be humble and lowly because it makes for proper relationships within the family of God. It greases the wheels, if you will, regarding our interactions as fellow Christians, brothers and sisters. If one of us becomes puffed up against another or against others, then it's obvious that the unity will eventually be disrupted. Now, what's interesting about this is that our lowliness is something that man tends to forget. And yet, thankfully, our great God remembers. For this, you need to turn back with me to the book of Psalms in the Old Testament. Go with me to the 103rd Psalm, Psalm 103, and begin reading with me. We'll start reading at verse 10. The psalmist says, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now, just pause right there. Aren't you and I glad? You know, the psalmist here, this psalm is ascribed to David. Uh, Think how thankful David must have been that God did not deal with David according to his sins. How grateful David must have been that God did not reward or recompense him according to his own iniquities. I mean, verse 10 right there, that's a weighty statement. And yet you and I living thousands of years later from David's day, we could echo that very sentiment. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. How grateful should we be? Verse 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Now, God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. James 4 and verse 6. His mercy is great toward them that fear him. That, that's a crucial uh, point to be considered there. But read on, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Oh, a beautiful, one of my favorite descriptions of God's forgiveness. When he forgives my sins, He removes them as far from me, the guilt, the condemnation associated with my sins. He removes all of that as far from me as the east is from the west. You say, well, how far is that? That's an infinite distance. Now, verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Now, that's the second time, even in our reading, that we find this crucial caveat or this crucial condition. And that is, if we want to be recipients of God's mercy, recipients of God's pity, we must fear God. We must exhibit the proper reverence and the proper godly attitude toward him in fear. But now verse 14 is our crucial statement. For he knoweth our frame. That's why I've been using that word throughout this study here today. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Now see, this is ironic. This is something that thankfully, how how grateful we should be that God remembers this. And yet, ironically, man, you and I, we tend to forget this. We tend to forget that that, that we have feet of clay, so to speak. In other words, we were formed from the dust of the earth. We are weak, frail creatures. 
We, we commit sin. We, we fall short of God's glory. This is who we are as humankind. And yet so often we can lose sight of that. We can forget that as though we are self-sufficient, as though we don't need God, we don't need Christ, we don't need the atonement, we don't need forgiveness. We may, we might well, not well, but we might forget that. But we are blessed that our God does not. Our God remembers our frame. He remembers that we are dust, and our God deals with us accordingly. No wonder, then, that our God's long-suffering is great. No wonder, then, that our God is full of love and compassion towards sinners, Romans 5, 6, and 8. No wonder, then. And, and so we've said all of this about lowliness. We've connected it to our very nature, the fact that man finds his fleshly origin, if you will, in the dust of the earth. God remembers that. We need to remember it as well. And a mindfulness of that spiritual reality will mean that we remain humble, that we remain lowly both before God, our Creator, but also before our fellow man as well. We need to ever remain lowly. Now, that is a sure antidote, a sure preventative to the vain glory of life. But here's another one. There's something else I want to add to this study. Number two, and that is there must be the acknowledgement that everything good that we have and everything good that we are morally and spiritually, it all comes from God. We need to remember that. The vain glory of life is vain in many respects because the individual has taken it upon himself. He has credited himself with his accomplishments. He's credited himself with his blessings and with his resources. He's credited himself with his talents and his abilities and his gifts. Well, the moment that happens, all of that glory, all of that honor associated with such blessings, it becomes vain. It's vain glory. It's pride. He's puffed up now against and before his creator. And, and so we would do well in the second place to remember the words of James. As James wrote them down in what we know as James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, referring to God, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, he's the Father of lights. God is light. God is good. And God is good all the time. There's, there's no variableness with God. There's no on again, off again. There's no good and evil. No, no, no. God is only good. And as such, he is the divine benefactor. He is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. Now think about that with me. If we really believe that, and, and if we really internalize James 1 and verse 17, and, and we start looking at life very differently, we realize that everything good that I have, everything good that I am, what, what little that might be morally and spiritually, if I am good before God, it is only because of Christ. It is only because of the power of His blood and the power of His gospel, His word. Everything good that we have, everything good that we are is because of God. You know what that does? That knocks the legs out from under pride, self-pride, vain glory 
of life. And so these two ideas together would serve us greatly in avoiding such sin. Number one, the fact that we are made from the dust of the earth and we are to be lowly and humble before God and man. Number two, every accomplishment, every good gift, every true blessing. Now, I'm talking about things that are in keeping with the will of God. All such blessings come from Him. I am nothing. I truly am nothing apart from God. That helps us greatly in avoiding the vainglory of life. Now, as we prepare to wrap up this study, I want us to take a case study from the Old Testament. Very quickly, go back with me to Judges chapter 15. And in Judges 15, we find ourselves in the midst of what some would call the Samson narrative, the inspired record in the book of Judges pertaining to Samson. And and there are a number of exploits and a number of events in his life that are recorded. But as we pick up with Judges 15, we pick up with the time that his own people, the, the people of Judah, now Samson was of the tribe of Dan, but his own people of Israel, these being particularly from Judah, they have come down to arrest Samson and to turn him over to the Philistines. Well, they, they bind him with these cords, verse 14, and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. Again, his miraculous strength, Samson exerted that, and he's now burst free from the, the, the bounds, if you were, or the bondage. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, a donkey, and he put forth his hand and took it, and he slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey have I slain a thousand men. Circle the word I. It, it's almost as if Samson is saying this as though the strength were his own. He did this on his own. But you move down to verse 18. Skip one verse down to verse 18. And he was sore athirst. We would describe that as acute dehydration. And he called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Isn't it interesting here that following yet another great victory by Samson, that God allows him to be reminded that he is flesh. He allows him to be reminded that his frame is mere dust, and thus, without God, without his blessings, and in Samson's case, without God's miraculous empowerment, he would be nothing. God keep us from the vain glory of life.